it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Sir John Lawton, who uh, is a, a very well-known British ecologist. He's currently RSPB Vice President. Um, and the, way, the reason I know him is he's president of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, where I used to work some time ago. Very much enjoyed working up in Yorkshire. But John is also president of the Institute of Environmental Sciences and chairman of York Museums Trust, a fantastic museum in, in York, if you ever go up there, and president of the York Ornithological Club. But his major contribution to uh, the environment and conservation was, of course, his report to the government entitled Making Space for Nature, which came out in 2010 and which has been at the core of virtually all recent environmental legislation. And it's, it was also the spur for the 12 nature improvement areas that were set up across the country to test the uh, test the hypothesis that John put across. Uh, we're going to be hearing a bit, a bit more about that, I'm sure, including one in our own area, area in North Devon, the, the Torrid, Torridge uh, catchment. Welcome to North Devon, Sir John. Over Great, to you. isn't it? You can be in two places at once. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. OK, well, thank you for asking me. Um, nice to nice to be with you. Um, I'm going to talk about, as Martin said, making space for nature, the past, the present and the future. And it starts, as Martin said, uh, when I was asked by the then Secretary of State in the in DEFRA, Hilary Benn, to chair a review of the State of England's Protected Area Network. And as Martin said, the report which was published in 2010 was called Making Space for Nature. And, uh, you know, some, somewhat, somewhat embarrassingly, it's now called the Lawton Report, which uh, I never thought it would be. <coughs> the executive summary uh, <coughs> of the report is now the, <coughs> excuse me, now the familiar mantra, more, bigger, better and joined, otherwise known as the Lawton Principles. Uh, you need we, because we, we we explained at the time that the UK, Eng England's wildlife was not in great shape. And what we needed were more designated sites or the creation of new sites. We needed bigger sites. We needed better managed sites. And we need to join them all up and enhance the connections between them. More, bigger, better and joined. And where possible, uh, do, do that at scale that creates a step change in conservation gains uh, and uh, try and make the wider environment more ecologically benign. Now, at the start, Making Space for Nature focused just on England. Uh, but the principles are now being applied throughout the UK and across continental Europe. But it is not about the marine environment. Uh, and uh, I know you, 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 one of your major interests is marine. Uh, but the principle, the general principles uh, apply to the marine environment as well. Um, and that was over a decade, a decade ago, coming up 11 years. Um, and I wanted to look at the history of how we got to that point. What was the history of wildlife conservation up to the point of making space for nature? And then where do we appear to be going? Um, and fingers crossed, the future is beginning to look better than it's looked to me for a long time, but we've got a long way to go. Now, as far as we know, the very first designated nature reserve in the world was established by Charles Waterton at Waterton Hall in surprise, surprise in Yorkshire, actually in West Yorkshire. By the way, I'm not actually from Yorkshire. I've lived in York for 50 years, uh, but I, I'm originally from Lancashire, as you can probably tell. Uh, and Waterton's reserve was 240 hectares. It was completely surrounded by a blooming great high wall so that people couldn't get in because the idea was in those days you couldn't go in a nature reserve. It was purely for nature, but it also meant that most creatures apart from birds couldn't get out either. And so it was completely isolated and we've no idea what actually happened to his nature reserve and nothing much else appears to have happened until the early years of the 20th century. So here's a history of, of, of where we are from the early years of the, ten, of, of the 20th century. The establishment of nature reserves after Waterton as a serious planned process uh, started uh, in, in, in about 1910. And that has run right through to the present day and will continue and will continue to be a cornerstone of nature conservation. Basically, we take good habitats, we declare them to be protected, uh, and uh, we hope that that will care for nature. As you are well aware, it helps, but it doesn't uh, solve the problem. Uh, the second phase, starting in about the 1950s, was the deliberate habitat creation within existing reserves, changing the habitat within existing reserves to produce a different kind of habitat into the one that was already there. Uh, I'm not going to say very much about that at all. 
Phase three, which started in the 1990s, is the deliberate creation of habitats outside existing reserves. That is to, uh, uh, to, to recreate uh, or uh, remake habitats in, in a working landscape. And then the, four, the, four, the final phase, which we're now in, uh, is rewilding. Started about 2000, slightly before that. And now the exact dates, but don't take the, the, the exact dates there as being precise. It's four phases. They often start slowly, slow burn, and then begin to pick up. They're the, about the time when people really began to notice when those things were happening. And it, it applies uh, at the talk, uh, and those times apply just to terrestrial and freshwater habitats, not marine habitats. So the start of, the, of modern nature conservation was started with this remarkable man, the Honourable uh, Charles Rothschild. He was an entomologist, a visionary, and as part of the Rothschild banking uh, family, fabulously wealthy. Uh, in 1912, he convened a meeting at the British Museum, Natural History Museum, with three friends uh, to formulate the first national strategy for nature conservation in the UK. And his genius and it really was genius, we take it for granted now, but it was to, genius was to realize that not only did individual species need protection, but so did entire habitats. And as a leader in the Times put it in December 1912, we're pretty confident that it was largely written by him, although it was a Times leader, he said, there is a need to preserve the tracks and nooks of land that represent the last relics of unspoiled nature, replete with their old native flora and fauna. They don't write like stuff, <laughs> write like stuff, stuff like that anymore. Uh, that was Rothschild's vision. Uh, and it's not possible to say precisely when the first reserves were, or as he called them, preserves were established, because they often developed over a period of time. But two of the earliest in which Rothschild was intimately involved was Wick and Fen, which was purchased by the National Trust uh, between 1915 and 1926. We forget that in the early years of the National Trust, it was very heavily into nature conservation. It then lost its way with that part of our national heritage, but has now rediscovered it. And, and they, they were purchased by the National Trust at the Society for Promotion of Nature Reserves uh, bequest. Uh, the S, uh, SPNR, of course, is now the, uh, the Wildlife Trust. And Rothschild himself purchased 340 acres of Woodwalton Fen in 1910 and gave it to SPNR in 1919. And my first experience of ever working on a nature reserve was at Woodwalton Fen uh, in, 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 in uh, 1962. It was life transforming for me. Woodwalton Fen and Wiccan Fen both still exist, but over the last hundred years, the destruction of many of the sites that identified by Rothschild is staggering and profoundly depressing. The data uh, are in this book, which is called Rothschild's Reserves. It was published in 1997, some time ago now, and Rothschild and his colleagues had identified 182 English sites worthy of preservation. Only 19, 10% of those survived essentially intact and still survive. 84, nearly half, still have more than half their habitats intact, but they've lost half of it. 58, 30, or just over 32%, just survive as remnants, more than half the habitats being destroyed, uh, and 21 have totally disappeared. Now, in Naked Space for Nature, we said just substitute the word cathedral in there, and there will be public outcry. We've lost half our all our medieval cathedrals. It would be disastrous. Yet somehow we didn't seem to care enough about these sites, which were regarded as the last relics of unspoiled nature in this country, uh, to hang on to them. Uh, and as the third State of Nature report in 2019 shows, the situation has hardly improved at all. I'm not going to take you through the, uh, the, 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 the catalogue of catastrophe. You can skip, you can read through those yourselves. Um, but on the evidence, the report said the UK would miss most of our biodiversity targets for 2020. The UK set itself biodiversity targets for 2020, and we did. We missed 17 of them. Uh, as one report put it here is the football results, the environment destruction 17, nature 3. Um, uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, government expenditure on biodiversity has fallen by nearly half, 42%. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, the nature and nature reserves are important, uh, the, the nature reserves are extremely important, but they're not delivering uh, and nature continues to decline apace. Why? Well, 
the usual uh, the catalogue of pollution, urbanization and construction of infrastructure all play a part, as do uh, the failure to manage many of our existing reserves properly uh, uh, because of cuts in government funding and so on. But the two biggest drivers are climate change and currently well ahead of that agricultural intensification. In the simplest possible terms, the UK as protected area network is just too small to stop the rot. But things are beginning to change. Let's look at the history of how we got to where we are. When Rothschild was alive between 1870 and the, just the beginning of the, first, of the Second World War, by the way, Rothschild committed suicide about two thirds of the way through that period in 1923, so money doesn't necessarily make you happy. He was a very tortured man. Uh, the landscape that Rothschild inherited, uh, or, or was concerned about, is represented by that, by that uh, sort of stylized map. Uh, the, in which the, 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 surround, the landscape is basically a very benign agricultural matrix. The dark green areas are remnants of nature identified by Rothschild as the first potential nature reserves. But in the landscape were also gray areas, remnant patches of unfarmed land, woods, common and areas too wet to farm that were just, just left. Because we have to remember that when Rothschild was writing, uh, was working between 1870 and the Second World War, Agriculture had been in serious depression with abundance of marginal land, an increase in rough grazing and a decline in the workforce of about 43 percent. So th th there was a lot of land uncultivated and extensive messy edges. So that's where we start. Then comes the, the, the Second World War and the, the, you'll, you'll recognize that the blobs and the shape of the, and the landscape are the same on all the following slides. It's just what, what happens to them changes. So between 1950 and 1970, end of the Second World War through to 1970, what Ian Newton in his wonderful new naturalist book called Farming of Birds in the Collins New Naturalist series refers to as the post-war farming revolution. It involved the mechanization and what Ian called the chemicalization of agriculture. Nature reserves are increasing in number, but the surrounding agricultural matrix is, in, is in becoming increasingly hostile to wildlife. Some of the sites identified by Rothschild are becoming nature reserves, but they're often much reduced in size, but there are still pockets of unfarmed land. Between 1970 and 2000, the process of agricultural intensification uh, continued apace, so much of the agricultural landscape, particularly of lowland England, is now hostile to wildlife. Many, not, not all sites of nature conservation value now have a degree of protection, either locally or nationally or through the planning system, but they're often much reduced in size. So paradoxically, although the number of protected sites increased markedly in the second half of the 20th century, the area of land available for nature decreased. Surviving sites became more isolated. We made less space for nature, not more, and inevitably species declined both in variety and abundance, despite the fact that the number of nature reserves increased. So Coon grassland in Devon illustrates this depressingly well. That's a photograph uh, of, of, of Dunsdon Reserve, Coon Glassland, one of the Devon Wildlife Trust Reserves that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And when we were doing the nature improvement areas, uh, I, I, I was privileged to be taken there by the Devon Wildlife Trust, where I saw a new plant that I'd never seen before, the three-lobed water crowfoot, which is a really pretty rare plant occurring in, in muddy puddles on, in the Coon Grassland. At the top there, you've got the, the situation at the end of the Second World War, all the yellow, yellow fields uh, uh, demark Coombe grassland. And you can see what happened to it. By, by, 1970, uh, by, by 2007, uh, it had been, the, 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 the many of the sites had been destroyed uh, and the ones that, the, the, the ones that survived were more fragmented and more isolated than they used to be. Inevitably, that means with increasing isolation and fragmentation and reduction in area, the coon grasslands become threatened. Realizing that the next phase in nature conservation really began when we, we, we moved to habitat restoration and recreation, beginning to, to recreate habitats that we lost. And we were surprisingly and to me bafflingly slow uh, to suddenly realize we could do it. We could restore nature, not just preserve it. 
Now, as far as I'm aware, there was no eureka moment when that happened, but it happened accidentally. But it took us a long time to realize that it was happening in plain sight. So the, the picture on the left there shows Leighton Moss in 1962. That was one of the very, very first natural history photographs I took uh, when I was when I was uh, was 19. Um, that's Leighton Moss and Wharton Hill behind. Uh, and it, it, of course, it, 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 this, that whole valley was drained and reclaimed for agriculture in, in 1822. Uh, but they was abandoned in 1918 because they couldn't afford to maintain the pumps. And the subsequent habitat restoration happened completely by accident to create what is now the current Leighton Moss. But it took us a long time to realize you could actually do that deliberately. Uh, and it became an RSPB reserve, by the way, in 1964. I did most of my really hard, most of my early birding there. I thought everybody had a place like that on their doorstep, and it took me a long time to realize they didn't. Uh, an even more famous Minsmere Reserve in Suffolk was initially created in 1940 deliberately by flooding agricultural land to prevent a coastal, a coastal invasion during the Second World War. And that habitat recreation was accidental, though within it, Bert Axel was one of the first people to put a, a additional habitat into an existing nature reserve with the famous scrape uh, at Minsmere. The whole reserve, by the way, is now 10 square kilometres and is one of the finest reserves in Britain. But again, the initial creation of Minsmere was an accident, and it took us a long time to realise that we could do that deliberately. So suddenly it dawned on us that conservation had to move from just preservation and to restoration of sites outside existing reserves. And that uh, that, that, that began really in the 1980s, when we identified a growing number of habitat restoration and recreation projects, putting nature back into a working landscape. The first RSPB project, for example, was the creation of Lake and Heath Fen in Suffolk. And when I was chairman of the Council of RSPB and Barbara Young was the chief executive. Now, the idea of recreate or creating an entire habitat was so unusual that several members of council rebelled and they thought buying carrot fields, which is what we did, was completely bonkers. Because as they accused me in the board meeting of the, 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 the RSPB board, there are no birds there. <laughs> and I said, no, of course there aren't, but there will be. <laughs> Just wait. Uh, and we created a three kilometer square wetland uh, which is now one of the finest wetlands in, 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 in southeast England. That one wouldn't have been possible, by the way, without heritage lottery funding, uh, uh, which, was, which has been instrumental in so much of uh, the habitat restoration and recreation that's now gone on. The first large scale government funded initiative was the Nature Improvement Area Competition, which is a recommendation from Making Space for Nature. Uh, it, we, we, it was just England, and we had 76 bids for nature improvement areas for all over the country, which 10 years ago or 11 years ago was a massive uh, reaff reaffirmation of what people really would like to do close to home. It, none of it was imposed. They were all consortia of the willing, made up of local communities, farmers, NGOs, utility companies, and so on, uh, to put nature back into their local re and regional landscapes. There were 12 winners, and they started work with a government grant. And you can see where they are and where they were. And as Martin has mentioned, you had one in North Devon, the North Devon NIA, which is indicated by the big blue arrow. They're all still there, and they're all still functioning. The modal size of the each NIA was about 500 square kilometres. And the, on the bottom right there, I, I've ruffled through my papers and I've found the original bid for the North Devon NIA for a nature improvement area. And that's the map uh, from their proposal to create an NIA, uh, or the, 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 the sea is the blue bit at the top, and it's the torridge catchment. And the habitats that survive and they wanted to recreate and restore are indicated as the various coloured blobs. Only about 5% of the area of each NIA was made more, bigger, better and joined uh, through habitat restoration and recreation. The total proportion in conservation management, of course, was much more than 5% because all the NIAs had some land that was already dedicated to conservation. And the new wildlife lab habitats restored and recreated amounted to just 25 square kilometres across all 12 NIAs. So it was pretty modest stuff. But it showed that it could be done. It showed that we knew how to do it and we could turn nature around by really quite straightforward measures. Uh, 
It's classical land sharing, that is weaving nature conservation into working landscapes of agriculture, forestry, urban brown spaces, parks and gardens involving water management and flood control systems and so on. So it's land sharing, sharing human activities with nature by putting nature into working landscapes. And all of the NIAs uh, were land sharing. Um, the alternative is called land sparing which is high intensity farming with absolutely no thought for wildlife. And by really, really screwing as much productivity out of you can out of the land, you spare land to set aside for nature conservation. Uh, to a degree, we already have some of this in classical nature reserves approaches embedded in intensely farmed landscapes. Uh, but naked space for nature was, was very much against, and I still am against, the idea of going down a land sparing route, really farming the hell out of the land you farm, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but to make more space for nature elsewhere. Because what that does is segregate more people from contact with nature. It requires two sets of land use policies, so it becomes complicated, and it could be potentially on the land that you're really screwing as hard as you can, potentially very damaging environmentally. But there is a debate to be had about the scale to which the relative merits of, of, of land sharing versus land sparing happen, but my favour, my strongly favour land sharing uh, where we can. Making Space for Nature also made a total of 24 other recommendations. The Nature, nature Improvement Area Competition was just one of them. Um, and we said several things that at the time were pretty revolutionary, but have now become mainstream. Uh, we said that more, bigger, better and join could be achieved while delivering other societal benefits. It wasn't just about nature conservation. Um, those other societal benefits are things like clean water, carbon storage and the prevention of flooding. We call, we call them now green infrastructure to deliver major societal benefits. And by delivering clean water, carbon storage and prevention of flooding, we can also deliver nature conservation. The climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, we said, had to be tackled together. They're not separate problems. We argued that farmers and land managers should be paid, not subsidized, to deliver these benefits. And we also discovered, re discussed rewilding, which was then very, very much in its infancy. And we concluded that rewilding may be part of the solution. It, it cannot be a substitute for the need to restore wildlife habitats closer to people over large areas of the country. Uh, and because basically most of our precious so-called natural areas are actually cultural landscapes shaped by human actions over millennia and delivering high nature value farming. If you stop or drastically change the farming, you lose that wildlife that goes with the cultural landscape. Now, rewilding, of course, will bring completely different sets of species in, but, uh, but a lot of the really treasured species we have in the UK landscape are actually high nature value farming systems, where, if at all possible, we should maintain them. Now, we're beginning to operate now in a really quite quickly changing political climate. I want to just uh, just just summarize briefly what's happening. It's almost as though the kaleidoscope has suddenly gone click and the picture has changed in a way that I that certainly when we were doing Make, making space for nature was not the case. I mean, government stated policy is is still to deliver more bigger, better, and joined. And the present government is committed to a 25 year environment plan, which includes a proposed nature recovery network. It is. It includes, they say, 25 new, large, each about 50 square kilometre nature recovery, nature recovery areas modelled on the nature improvement areas, using that as the model, not a, 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 a consortia of the willing. A commitment by the Prime Minister to protect 30% of the UK land area. The promotion of local nature recovery strategies. They're currently being piloted in five locations, five counties, Buckinghamshire, Cornwall, Cumbria, Greater Manchester and Northumberland, with a, a million pound government investment to identify opportunities for nature recovery and create, as I just said, consortia of the willing uh, to deliver them. If it works there, the idea is to roll that out nationally across England. The recognition that a healthy environment can play a, a, promote, a, a hugely important part in promoting people's health and well-being. And the new environmental land management scheme, the ELMS, will have a strong focus on rewarding farmers, that is paying them, for providing societal benefits. Then that fundamentally changes the political landscape. Of course, uh, um, they're all, they're strong on rhetoric and promises. Um, 
uh, uh, but they're happening against an emerging global realization that the planet is not in great shape. On the 5th of June, which is World Environment Day, the UN will launch its decade on ecosystem restoration. Uh, and the aim is to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of ecosystems worldwide. And Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, uh, said 2021 must be the year to reconcile humanity with nature. And the UK, re we really are in pole position here because we hold the presidency of the G7 uh, and the climate change COP26 pro uh, pro uh, meeting is going to be held later in November in Glasgow that we also chair. So we have to be seen to be leading by example, and that puts a lot of pressure on the government. So let's hope we're all going to be wise owls. But they are going through a period of huge social and political uncertainty, uh, and there are huge opportunities as well as some threats. And I'm not naive. The government's stated positions, wonderful as they are, are long on aspirations, and they're short on implementations. By implementation, I mean the details of how by who, where, and how much money. Because at least uh, we're talking about these things that we've never done in my lifetime. But here are some of the issues that I, either I don't understand or government has not been clear about. Agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. How are DEFRA's proposed environmental management schemes, ELMS, going to bring climate crisis and biodiversity crisis together by paying farmers and land managers to deliver public goods whilst reducing greenhouse gas emissions from farming? What's going to happen to the Great Northern Forest when uh, two years ago, everybody was talking about the Great Northern Forest and, and, and Michael Gove was talking about creating a huge forest that ran all the way from Manchester to, 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 to Halifax. Um, it seems to have disappeared off the radar. And who's going to pay for it anyway? What exactly will the Green Recovery Fund do? What about the policy of the net biodiversity gain for planning developments? The opportunities really are enormous. The implementation is going to be in the detail and the government, I can see signs already beginning to roll back. So as the two beavers are saying there, perhaps we should hold our, perhaps we should help with the other one saying, uh, yeah, but don't, don't hold your breath except underwater. Um, but, 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 you know, it, it, but, but, but it's a huge amount, that, but, and it's a huge, but there's a huge amount going on outside government. And I don't think most people realize just how much is going on outside government. Here are just some of them. What we're doing, actually, this is a, you're going to see this diagram again at the end, but what you've got along the bottom there is the area of land in nature conservation. It may be a nature reserve, it may be a, a, a bigger area, a rewilding area and so on. And it's, it's on a logarithmic scale. It goes one hectare, 10 hectares, one hectare, uh, then right through to uh, 10 square kilometres, 100 square kilometres and so on. Uh, and each blob is a site on that spectrum. And up the, up the, up the right-hand side, the vertical axis, you've got a qualitative scale, which is management intensity. The amount of management required on the protected site to deliver effective nature conservation. And we know that per unit area, per hectare, or per square kilometre, the amount of management fiddling around that we have to do as site managers is less per hectare or per square kilometre, the bigger the area, because nature takes over the processes. If you've got a precious little fragment of chalk grassland on which you're trying to maintain uh, less than a hectare in size, on which you're trying to maintain a precious pot population of orchids. You basically have to cut the grass with nail scissors to keep the orchids there because you can't graze it. If you've got a hundred square kilometers, you can just let sheep go over it and they'll graze it for you and you'll get you'll keep the orchids. It's, it's not rocket science. Uh, and what we're trying to do with nature conservation in the UK now and indeed across Europe is move our protected sites in the top left hand corner of that diagram down towards the bottom right hand side. That's what we're trying to do. And I'm going to show you how we're going about doing it. Across all sources of funding outside government, what's now happening in the UK and Europe is really exciting. So going from roughly from smaller to larger areas, um, initiatives that are planned or in train, these are not all of them, these are some of them, I'm going to bang through the names and then we're going to look at them. The examples of land sharing are farmer clusters initiatives, National Trust Priority Habitats Initiative, Jordan's Farm Partnerships, Natural Cambridgeshire, the Wildlife Trust Living Landscapes, RSPB Futurescapes, the Yorkshire Peat Partnership, and T-Swell Naturally Connected. Oh, pause for breath. Between land sharing and rewilding, we've got this wonderful project called Wild Ken Hill in Northwest Norfolk, and then rewilding initiatives, you've got NEP, Wild Ennerdale, 
the Cambridge Conservation Initiatives Endangered Landscapes Programme, the Cairngorms Connect, and several additional sites that Raul Rewilding Britain is, is talking about. I'm going to go through all those. Those are just some of them. But the scale uh, on which it's happening is enormous. The fascinating thing is, and I've been banging on to Natural England and the Cambridge Conservation Initiative about this for a couple of years, there is no central register of the scale and extent of habitat restoration and recreation going on in the UK. This is not just England now, by the way, it's England, Wales, Scotland. Uh, but it's big. It really is big. We might just have turned the corner where we're putting more habitat back than we're destroying. That's, but we don't know that for certain. It's like trying to restore your bank balance without knowing how much money you're putting in every week. Um, and we really do need to know so we can say, look, we're making progress. It's not all bad and we know how to do this stuff. So let's just set aside rewilding for the moment and have a look at some land sharing initiatives. There's a wonderful example of land sharing initiative. Uh, that's the one of your beaver reintroduction programs on farmland in Devon that I was privileged to go and see uh, September, not last September, September before that. Wonderful site. Boy, have they transformed the landscape. Uh, and that's land sharing on a piece of on a piece of farmland. You probably know much more about that than I do. And by the way, kneeling down in there to um, uh, to photograph the beavers and their dams, I got land disease serves me right so let's look at the, some of those the farmer clusters initiative now that's a sort of that's various sponsors natural england game and wildlife conservation trust the rural and payments agency so there is some government in there there's quite a lot of politics got tangled up now in the farmer clusters initiative uh, search that example the last uh, report on its website is november 2018 but the idea is that it's modeled on the marlborough downs nature improvement area so the government and game and wildlife conservation trust in natural england took the marlborough downs nature improvement area which was entirely farmer lead uh, and there's a map of uh, the, the, the sites of the marlborough downs on which they put a lot of habitat back into their land at very, quite a lot of their own expense um, uh, uh, did, did did a wonderful job. Uh, so it's the, the farmer clusters are modelled on that where groups of farmers get together and they decide on their own conservation plans. Um, the work is often uh, subsidised by our existing agri-environment schemes, but several clusters have been set up uh, with no funding except the farmer's own money. Uh, and uh, at the last reported recorded thing, 4,000, uh, which is the website in November 2018, I know it's much more than that now, 4,500 square kilometres of farmland, 1,700 individual farmers uh, were involved in putting nature back into their own farms. Just one example, the picture on the right there is the South Downs National Park and two thirds of the South Downs National Park, uh, right essentially on the edge of London, is now covered by a total of eight farmer clusters. Uh, putting nature really back into the, that landscape at scale. So many of these farms now, what used to be common farmland birds, uh, are, are recovered remarkably, and it shows absolutely that profitable agriculture does not have to be birdless or free of nature. The National Trust Priority Habitats Initiative aims to create and restore 250 square kilometres of habitats on trust land by 2025, and that's only 10% of trust land. Have 50% of its farmland nature friendly, uh, with, with a whole lot of targeted habitat restoration and recreation projects, again modeled on the nature improvement areas, working in, in, in partnership with land, landowners and their tenant farmers. And I know for a fact that, ne that the National Trust are keen to do quite a lot more of that. The ne National Trust have come back on board seeing wildlife conservation as part of our cultural heritage. As I say, they lost it after the, uh, around about the 1920s and only really began to pick up the batting end five years ago, but they've made, they make, uh, maybe a decade ago now, but they're making huge progress. And of course they're massive landowners. A, a private, in, a, 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 an industry initiative, jo the Jordan's Farm Partnership, Jordan's Porridge Oats, which I, 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 I urge you to buy. I, I, I have them for my breakfast regularly. Um, 2016, uh, got 42, uh, the, their main suppliers of oats, uh, to set aside each one, to set aside at least 10% of their land on each farm for wildlife. The Wildlife Trust Living Landscapes. 
um, uh, 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 which uh, uh, recently uh, uh, the, 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 they've also added the 30%, they want 30% of the whole of the UK in, in nature conservation uh, as part of their targets. But the Living Landscapes has been running for a couple of decades now and has been absolutely wonderful in putting huge amounts of land back into nature conservation across the wildlife trusts. So there are here two, two pictures of two sites. The upper one there is a completely recreated hay meadow in Ravenstone Dale in Cumbria, uh, done by the Cumbria Wildlife Trust. The whole site is about two miles long, uh, with completely returned to these wonderful uh, hay meadows. And on the right there, which Martin may recognise, that's Huxterwell Marsh. I don't know whether we were doing that when you were there, Martin. Newly created wetland at Pottery Car. That's nearly a mile across, both ways. Um, and the, the, the Pottery Car Reserve now, with the, a, a lot of additional habitats, you can't walk around Pottery Car Reserve, which is on the railway line south of Doncaster. Uh, you can't walk around it in a day. It's too big. Um, it, it, it's, it's absolutely transformed that landscape and that landscape acts as a major flood water holding area so that Doncaster doesn't flood. So it isn't just about wildlife conservation, it's about stopping Doncaster from flooding. The Suffolk Wildlife Trust, this is, I've just picked three at random. The Suffolk Wildlife Trust, uh, creation of, of Carlton Marshes west of Lowestoft. Uh, there's a, the, all the pale green on that. Their, their, their core reserve is the, are the dark green bits and the pale green bits are the, 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 the two mile long, completely being recreated uh, set of extra habitats uh, on either side uh, of the, the Share Marsh and Petros Marsh, uh, adding to the size of the reserve. And this is going on around all the Wildlife Trust reserves uh, as we speak. And the Wildlife Trust don't have a hand on how much of this is going on. There's no central register, which is again, repeat myself, is staggering. <clears throat> the Yorkshire Peat Partnership, which again, Martin will know about, is a partnership to restore and recreate peatlands across Yorkshire. I don't know how many of you have heard of it down there in Devon, but it's one of the largest habitat restoration projects in the UK and has been for the last decade. To date, we've restored over 300 square kilometres of unput blanket bog, have been restored to deliver clean water flood control and carbon storage, all of which are huge societal benefits and wildlife. So in return for those societal benefits, we get these. It's a complete no brainer. The RSPB, of course, is doing a huge amount of this and they do know, typical RSPB, they know exactly how much land they've restored and recreated. And in terms of wetlands, uh, since between 1900 and 2015, they've restored and recreated nearly 88 square kilometers of wet grassland, reed beds, intertidal habitats and saline lagoons. And the biggest of these uh, is the Wallasey Island in Essex. There's a photograph of Wallasey Island, which is just huge. Built, by the way, take, using solid, the, the, the borings taken out in the construction of Crossrail. They had to go somewhere and they were used to, uh, to create basically a huge new island around a, a tiny little existing island, Wallasey Island, which is now one of the biggest uh, restored habitats, 6.7 6 square kilometres of, of Wallace Island, but all the others are listed on there. Um, Natural Cambridgeshire, which was established in 2020, aims to double the area of wildlife rich habitat and natural green spaces in, in, in Cambridgeshire uh, and, and Peterborough. Um, the current area is 8.5% and they're proposing to double that for the benefit of residents, visitors and businesses. They don't even add, it's climate change, don't even add wildlife, <laughs> but that's what, the effect it will have. And there's Wick and Fen, I showed you a picture that I took very early on in my natural history career. Um, and uh, that, that's the, the, the little block of land on the top, on the top right of the Wick and Fen, and all the rest of there is restored and completely recreated habitats over a vast area. That's the National Trust. And one of the largest individual land sharing schemes is Tees Swale Naturally Connected, which is 829 square kilometres in the northern Pennines, running from the top end of the Yorkshire Dales National Park into the North Pennine area of outstanding natural beauty. And that's the pink area on the map there. And some of you might just have heard of Barnard Castle. I don't know how you'll have heard of Barnard Castle, but that's the town just over on the right. Uh, I chair the project board for Tees Swale Naturally Connected. Uh, it's so uh, again, classical land sharing in high nature value farming, where we're working with farmers over that huge area of Swaledale, Upper Teesdale, uh, 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 the, the Durham Moors and so on, uh, to put to restore natural habitats over a vast area, nearly 830 square kilometres of the northern Pennines. And, and I'm the privilege to be the chair of that. 
and and then move those are all land sharing let's just move now to a beginning that's beginning to rewild wild ken hill is in northwest norfolk um it's a project supported by rewilding europe uh, but it's 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 privately owned land and it's a mixture of small scale rewilding which is the block of land in the middle there it's adjacent to a, a traditional conservation area traditional nature reserve which is the the picture on the right there uh, but the rewilding area has been farmland it's not big it's only four to four just over four square kilometers uh, but they're allowing the action to come back and then over a bigger area uh, of about 600 hectares, six square kilometers. Uh, they're doing pioneering, what they call pioneering regenerative farming, uh, where they're, they're doing nature friendly farming over 600 hectares. That whole block of land is now absolute, will absolutely transform wildlife conservation in that part of, of Northwest Norfolk. And that's done because the landowners want to do it. So where does rewilding, to finish off, where does rewilding come in on this, this romp through some wonderful, exciting things? Well, this is a highly stylized diagram. It, it, it's just to get you, to get your head around it. The, the bottom axis there is the percentage of land under cultivation from zero at the left-hand end to all the land under cultivation at the right-hand end. And the opposite of that has got to be the, just the mirror image of that, the naturally, semi-natural and naturally occurring habitats from 100% at the bottom left at the bottom to zero at the top. Uh, nature reserves um, and uh, the traditional nature reserves sit in that larger blob, uh, that's, uh, uh, the, the, se the second from top. Agri-environments, agri-deserts are sit right at the top. That's, 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 that is the land sparing model in which you just farm the hell out of land and you don't care about, there's virtually no nature there over vast areas. Then you've got na the nature reserves in working landscapes. It's a continuum of moving into a, what we would recognize as a cultural landscape, uh, an ancient landscape created by human activities over long periods of time with a lot of, of extremely nature friendly farming going on in it. And at the bottom left hand corner, you've got rewilding. And from Rothschild onwards, the direction of travel for UK landscapes has been up and to the right of this diagram. We can we be, you know, keep moving up and to the right of it. Um, and the conservation movement has been trying to hold the fort and try and move it down to the left. Uh, we rewilding being the final phase. Uh, rewilding or preparing rewilding. I mean, it, you, you can you can argue a huge length. How big is, does it need to be to rewilding? And actually, it really isn't about scale. Uh, it's not the main distinction between rewilding and land sharing. It, it, it really isn't. But I, I, very speaking, very roughly, if, if I did have to put my own personal preference on it, I'd say it starts at roughly 10 square kilometres. Uh, nature conservation at scales bigger than 10 square kilometres, where the whole area is in nature conservation, starts to be serious rewilding. But the key difference between traditional nature conservation and uh, rewilding is that rewilding is not goal orientated. It, lets, it aims to let nature get on with it over as big an area as possible, with as little human interference as possible, with virtually the whole area devoted to wildlife conservation rather than other forms of land use. In traditional nature reserve management, we have goals. We try and, you know, we graze them. We, we control the water levels. We, we, we do all those things. Uh, we, we even cut the grass with nail scissors. Uh, the, and the bigger the area and the more rewilding you can do, the more you can rewild, the less and less and less human interactions you need. You might, might need, you still need some, and it isn't entirely goal oriented. It is partly goal oriented, as we'll see. And there are two key areas in Britain that I'm sure you've heard of. The, the first is Wild Ennerdale there, uh, 47 square kilometres of the Lake District. And the one on the right there is the Nep Estate, 25 kilometres from Gatwick Airport. If you can rewild 25 kilometres from Gatwick Airport, you can rewild anywhere on the Nep Estate, which is 14 square kilometres. The Lake District is 2,292 square kilometers, and Edale is just 2% of the total land area. So it's tiny compared with the entire Lake District. Wouldn't it be great if you can rewild the whole landscape? Uh, and it's possible, it's, only, it's probably the only valley in the Lake District you can do it uh, because the, the whole land, virtually all the land is owned by just three landowners, the National Trust, the Forestry Commission, and a water company, United Utilities working in partnership. Now, why would a water company get involved? Because they want clean water 
as clean a water as possible, as cheaply as possible. And if by rewilding Ennerdale, so that the water flowing into Ennerdale water, which is behind you, which is actually a reservoir, uh, it's six times cheaper to, sorry, 60 times cheaper to rewild Ennerdale and produce clean water than it is to build a water treatment works. It's a complete no-brainer. And you've got the same with Southwest Water and the restoration of the Coombe grasslands. That's why Southwest Water is putting money into storing Coombe grasslands, because it gives them clean water at much lower cost than building water treatment works. Take the sheep off the hills and the vegetation recovers dramatically. Marsh fritillary is one of the rarest but endangered butterflies have recolonized the valley. The vegetation in the valley is recovered from sheep grazing uh, and is just transformed. And the wider societal benefits are enormous, as well as clean water. This is a, you, you reckon, a map of the Lake District. Cockermouth at the top there on the River Cocker, which flows out of Buttermere and Crummet water, which is at the, the second arrow down, has flooded terribly at least twice recently. Massive floods through Cockermouth. The Ahern flows out of Ennerdale uh, through the Ennerdale, Bri through Ennerdale Bridge, Cleeter and Egremont. And you've never, they've never been flooded and you've never heard of them even though the same rainfall falls on the, the they're both, from, both those rivers come from exactly the same catchment. They fall on the, uh, the, 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 the rivers running out to the west and northwest of Great Gable. They receive exactly the same rainfall. The difference is that rewilding Ennerdale releases its water much more slowly and avoids any flash flooding. Ennerdale acts like a blooming great big sponge and the water just trickles down off the hill, held back by meanders, held back by debris dams. And it, so that and the, 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 the never floods. The, the, basically what that we're doing in a lot of our uplands and, and uh, the, 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 the land to the, the north of, um, uh, to the north of, of the site, going, going through the river Cocker, and, and what, over most of the Pennines and Malaysia, the Dead District, what we're doing is paying sheep farmers to flood Ennerdale, to flood Cockermer. Yes. Think about it. That's what we do. We pay sheep farmers to flood, flood cities downstream. That's why Leeds floods, because we pay farmers to graze the hell out of the, of the northern Pennines. It, it makes no sense. I mean, <laughs> you can quote me on that because it's, it, it's absolutely true. So that's another huge societal benefit from re that rewilding. And the Nepa State uh, uh, was, it, is a voluntary exercise by Charlie, Bur Charlie Burrell and Izzy Tree. They're, they're married. The Trizzy, Izzy is a wonderful writer. Uh, you, the, her book on on on, uh, on rewilding the Nepa State is you've got to you've, you've really got to you really must read it. It's quite small. It's for uh, it's 14 square kilometers. But it reminds us that rewilding is a process designed to bring back nature at scale. And it's an attitude of mind that just lets nature get aim on with it as much as possible over as big an area as possible. And the results are just amazing. It, NEP is, uh, has increasing population of nightingales and turtle doves, probably the only place in England that has. And it has the biggest population of purple emperor butterflies in the UK. Nobody knew there were purple emperor butterflies within 50 miles of the place. And these have all introduced themselves naturally. They all arrived unaided. There were tree nesting ravens, 25 miles from Gatwick Airport, tree nesting peregrine falcons, 25 miles from Gatwick Airport, and abundant buzzards and red kites all come back on their own because of the habitat that we restored and recreated. It, I think it's wonderful. And white storks, there's a reintroduction program for white storks. So, it, that, it, so it's not, a, the rewilding in NEP is not entirely not goal orientated. It has a goal of putting some species back in uh, that wouldn't get there on their own. Uh, the, and the aim is to establish a free flying wild population in West Sussex with a lot of other landowners. So there's a whole lot of other landowners now in getting in on the, they want storks on their land. And uh, two pairs, uh, uh, bred successfully in 2020 uh, from the captive breeding birds. One of them was a captive female that had been injured. The other one was a wild bird that had, came from Holland, uh, found itself a mate and nested in an oak tree uh, on the estate. And then the final pro program involved with uh, is a thing called the Endangered Landscape Program, started in 2018. And it's not just in the UK, it's on a continental European scale. It's funded by, and I chair the project program, the project program board for this as well. Uh, it's funded by Arcadia, which is the charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin, uh, which is the Tetra Pak uh, Foundation, Tetra Pak people. And they've invested an initial down payment of $30 million to restore habitats across Europe. We've just received a second tranche of $30 million uh, about two months ago. 
Um, and the whole initiative is administered by the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. So the, 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 the map shows you where the sites are. Uh, there are two kinds of projects. The, the really big millions of pounds of project implementation grants, and they're the dark blue dots. And you'll see there's, there is actually one of those, that's number two in, up in Scotland. The one that's labeled three there is in Wales. And for the, for the moment, we've been having some, some problems with that, and that's become modified to a, uh, to a project planning grant to help them develop the program. And the others are scattered all the way across Europe. And I'm just going to talk about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the project two there, which is in the Cairngorms project in the Cairngorms called Cairngorm Connect. Um, it's the biggest habitat restoration, re 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 restoration recreation project in the UK. It's 600 square kilometers. Uh, it's in the Cairngorms National Park, so you can see where it is. It's, it covers about a third of the whole of the Cairngorm National Park in that lower diagram. And this, again, is only possible because there are only three landowners, RSPB, uh, Forestry Scotland and Wildlands UK, uh, which is the private estate of Anders Paulsen, the, the Danish fashion billionaire. Uh, and uh, you, you might think, well, this is wilderness already. Why do we need to do anything to it? Well, yes, but it's a very barren wilderness. It's massively overgrazed, by, particularly by red deer and by sheep. The natural tree line has gone. Some of the you know, montane scrub forest has been entirely destroyed. There's no tree, tree regeneration and so on and so forth. And the plan is a hundred year plan to put really wild nature back at scale over three massive land holdings, which total 600 square kilometers of the Cairngorms. So here's a cartoon spectrum of the diagram you've seen, but we're now rewilding on it. Uh, you can see where the rewilding sites, the endangered landscape program sit, uh, that big block there in the middle, the, the really, really big scale stuff. You can see where Wild Ennerdale sits, NEP. And you can see some of the, 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 the iconic sites, the Usvadersplassen in the Netherlands, which is 60 square kilometers, a rewilding site in the Netherlands that I'm sure you've heard of. And then you've got two of the world's real wildernesses, Yellowstone and Okavango, down there in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, we're never going to get there, but what we're doing is, I, I, I think, is enormously exciting, uh, putting nature back at scale, uh, both in the UK and across Europe. And of course, the, the, all these come with some reintroduction programs, um, the, the, alongside this, the plans to establish white storks. Uh, there are plans to put other species back into some of these landscapes. So to that extent, they, as I said, they are goal orientated. We know how to do it. We've done it with cranes and red kites and white tailed eagles uh, of all now re-establishing themselves. I don't think it'll be long before you white tailed eagles move out of the Isle of Wight down into where you are in Devon as they spread along the south coast. Uh, there, there are now numerous beaver reintroduction programs, and of course, Devon has led the world, led, led England in, in, in some of that. The Devon Wildlife Trust's wonderful program of, of beaver reintroductions, uh, and the the, uh, the mysterious population that appeared on the River Otter. Um, I, I wonder where they came from. Um, uh, the, the, uh, um, there are plans to introduce pine martins in several sites, including Ennerdale. There was a very ill-prepared rogue scheme to introduce lynx into Kilda Forest by the thing called the Lynx Trust, which English nature, Natural England quite right, rightly turned down. But I think Lynx will, will, will eventually get Lynx back into some parts of Britain because they, uh, they, they, they feed mainly on rabbits uh, and they, they, they would very much help to solve the, uh, the, road, the, the deer overgrazing because they will also take roe deer fawns. European bison. Well, when I first did this talk 18 months ago, this was just a dream and I had to insert on there already here. There are four just been introduced into Kent Wildlife Trust Bleem Wood Reserve in the spring of, of, of last year. Uh, and apparently they're, they're settled in, settling in well. Uh, and uh, we can look forward to more uh, European bison in our woods in the UK over the next 10 years. Wolves, who knows? Cairngorms, anybody? <laughs> Who knows? Uh, probably not yet and probably not for a long time. But I think eventually we might just get uh, enough wildland, particularly in Scotland, to dream about putting wolves back into the landscape. But I think, it, I think at the moment, the, the political culture, political uh, views and population views, I don't think would allow it. On the other hand, it will be a marvellous example of success of rewilding. If we got really big predators back into the landscape. We're getting there. It's probably not enough, but I just hope we have the wit, wisdom and willpower to do this and to make more space for nature for the benefits of people and wildlife. Thank you.